this entire year, 2019, especially in the late summer and the fall that we've entered, hundreds, perhaps thousands of churches in our country, along with educational institutions, libraries, museums, art galleries, and civic organizations, have been holding events to recognize and to acknowledge that this year, 2019, is the 400th anniversary of the arrival of the first African slaves to what would become the present-day United States. A cursory online search conducted a few days ago showed that dozens and dozens of Unitarian Universalist congregations have been holding services, marking and reflecting on the 1619 anniversary. The most recent search I did showed that a whole bunch of them are happening right this morning. So if you don't like my comments and want to hear somebody else did it better, you should go check that out. Right here in Chapel Hill, there is currently a small historical exhibition on display at the Orange County Public Library that tells the story of the arrival of the first slave ship to Port Comfort, Virginia. There is also currently an art exhibition at a gallery on Franklin Street featuring sculptures by Durham artist Stephen Hayes that were created in response to this 400 year anniversary. Both the library and art installation are showing for just one more week. So if you've not had the chance to see them and you're planning to do so, uh, this next week is the time to do it. And um, if you don't have plans this afternoon at the Epilogue Bookstore on Franklin Street, the NAACP Religious Affairs Committee is hosting a discussion about these two exhibitions. Tomorrow, the Sonia Haynes Stone Center for Black Culture and History at UNC is hosting a day-long event entitled the 1619 Collective Memories Symposium. And so if you wanted to go to that and have not already signed up, be aware that the website says that it is full, but that they're going to attempt to sit people in another room to watch it live stream. So just fair, fair warning if that piques your interest. The stated goal of the 1619 Project, which this sermon is uh, commemorating, is to reframe American history by considering what it would mean to regard 1619 as our nation's birth year, which would require us to place the consequences of slavery and the contributions of black Africans at the very center of the story we tell ourselves about who we are as a country. At the same time, as I was becoming familiar with the 1619 Project, I decided to read it alongside another uh, book. The book that I read it alongside is this year's Common Read. Each year for the past nine years, the Unitarian Universalist Association has held a Common Read inviting all Unitarian Universalists to read a book together. This year's selected book is An Indigenous People's History of the United States by Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz. And like the 1619 Project, this book also seeks to tell the history of our nation in a way that challenges and disrupts the way history is typically understood. To quote from the foreword of that book, Writing U.S. history from an indigenous people's perspective requires rethinking our national narrative. That narrative is wrong or deficient not in its facts, dates, or details, but rather in its essence. Inherent in the myth we've been taught is an embrace of settler colonialism and genocide. The myth persists not for lack of free speech or poverty of information, but rather for an absence of motivation to ask questions that challenge the core of the scripted narrative of our origin story. How might acknowledging the reality of US history work to transform our society today? 
So the 1619 Project and an indigenous people's history of the United States, similar in many ways, similar in describing horrific violence, genocide, and oppression, similar in attempting to correct the historical record, and similar, similar in, once you've kind of read it and internalized it, helping us to understand how this history shapes the story we find ourselves in, so as to understand the shape of our world as it is today. I think back to when I first learned American history, or first learned American history in high school. I was fortunate. My 11th grade history teacher uh, was an Italian-American gentleman named Mr. Frio. Mr. Frio, a name that we translated imprecisely as Mr. Cool, <laughs> or Mr. Cold when we were mad at him. Mr. Frio was the type of history teacher who had posters on his wall of uh, one poster of W.E.B. Du Bois and another poster of the band Neil Young and Crazy Horse. That kind of describes what kind of history teacher he was. And throughout the year, he periodically assigned us additional reading, entire chapters of Howard Zinn's A People's History of the United States, that he assigned as a corrective to what our course textbook misrepresented or failed to represent. And um, this, I'm now grateful for it, but at the time it, it upset me that I had to do extra reading to correct the reading that I had read. <laughs> and then he made us write these papers on what was left out of the original reading, and I didn't get why he couldn't just assign us the correct story to begin with, but that's <laughs> neither here nor there. Now I'm grateful. Now I understand his pedagogy yeah. at that time. But even so, even so, as someone blessed with background that I consider to be fairly progressive, I'm struck as I read these two resources the 1619 Project, and Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz, Indigenous People's History, I was struck by how much I am embarrassed to say I did not know, did not fully realize, or fully understand. At the basis, at, the, at its most basic, I think one of the understandings that I wasn't given, that, that many of us are not given, is a sense of what civilization existed in North and Central and South America in 1491. The depth of that civilization. For example, Dunbar Ortiz cites scientists and historians who set the population of the Americas in 1491 at, guess, guess a population of this, this hemisphere. A million. No, 70, million. 70 million? So she gives the number of 70 to 100 million. By which comparison, Europe at that same period in 1491, Europe is 50 to 70 million. So equal, equal populations. One spread over a much bigger area, but, but equal populations. And in fact, uh, scientists today are saying that there was a period in the 1600s, a period of worldwide global cooling that followed the, um, because of the amount of uh, death and genocide that was, a, was part of colonialism. There's one passage in Dunbar Ortiz's book that, that blows my mind now, the whole book is, is heavy and haunting, and there are many points that, uh, images that leave me really, um, you know, sick to my stomach. But I'm gonna share one that isn't, that isn't a graphic image, but it is an image that just, that just haunts me. And had the toughest time wrapping my head around. One sentence, I'll, I'll say it twice and, and 
See if you can get what this is saying. Paradoxical as it may seem, there was undoubtedly much more forest primeval, virgin forest, in North America in 1850 than in 1650. Let me read that again. Paradoxical as it may seem, there was undoubtedly much more forest primeval in North America in 1850 than in 1650. Does that sentence surprise anybody here? It surprised the first service, so. <laughs> what that sentence is saying is that through war, disease, and genocide, a significant and substantial part of land that had been cultivated and shaped by indigenous peoples returned to a natural state before being later recultivated or resettled by migrating Europeans. I don't recall ever learning that history why does that image stick with me? Why does that image, amid so many images of barbaric brutality, stick with me? The image is so striking to me for a couple of different reasons, but one of those reasons has to do with this idea that the truth of the past can be erased from our view. This idea that we might come face to face with reality and not be able to see the deeper story the truth that shapes our reality, that we can't see, sometimes cannot see, the very story we find ourselves in. James Baldwin wrote of history, history as nearly no one seems to know is not near, merely something to be read, and it does not refer merely or even principally to the past. It could scarcely be otherwise, since it is to history that we owe our frames of reference, our identities, and our aspirations. The great force of history comes from the fact that we carry it within us, are, unconscious, are unconsciously controlled by it in many ways, and history is literally present in all that we do. History is literally present in all that we do. The 1619 Project begins with this bold assertion that there is no aspect of this country that's been left untouched by the 250 years of slavery and its legacy. There is no aspect of this country that has been left untouched by 250 years of slavery and its legacy. And as you read the essays in, in that collection, you may to think about things that are um, obvious, but, th but things that, you know, I don't think I'll ever see a pound of sugar the same way again. The title I gave to my remarks this morning is The Story We Find Ourselves In. This is this idea that our lives, our stories, there's the story of ourselves as individuals, there's the story of our families, of our ancestors, of our communities, there is the story also of a nation. How do we tell these stories and how should we tell these stories? I was talking with Marion this week and she said something that uh, I just had to, had to write down. She said, I want to teach people to tell stories that are not the stories of empire. Not the stories of empire. I want to teach people to tell stories that are not the stories of empire. And we can tell the story of our lives, our families, our communities, our countries. We can tell that in ways that advance a narrative of empire. We can tell stories in ways that deny or pretend that this does not exist. Or we can tell these stories in ways that expose, illuminate, and even resist the narrative of empire. How do we do that? How do we tell stories, our own stories, the stories of our lives, the stories of our country, in ways that expose? There are three things 
that I think are important for this. First, it's important to know history, to learn history, and to practice being more awake and more aware to the ways in which the legacy of stolen lands and stolen hands has an impact in, on our life every single day. This involves choosing to read and watch and attend and go to libraries and art museums and travel to places. There's a trip to Selma and Montgomery coming up. Travel to places where we learn the fuller history of the story we find ourselves in. The next important thing to do is to attempt in our lives to center voices of historically marginalized people and to practice listening to these voices. It's to ask the question, whose voice isn't being welcomed at the table? What voice are we not hearing here? A former intern of mine, someone I mentored into ministry, she currently serves the church in New York, uh, did an experiment uh, some time ago in which she spent a year reading only books by queer women of color. I realized that in terms of, I don't I'm not even sure that I could put together that bibliography. Much less. But then it was an experiment. She wanted to see how her own thinking would be altered and disrupted by listening to voices that she may not usually pay attention to. And so in recent years, and I, I can't claim to have done that experiment, but, but in recent years I've been intentional about trying to expose myself to voices. James Baldwin and James Cone. Carol Anderson and Henry Louis Gates, Patrice Cullors and Adrian Marie Brown, Jasmine Ward and Ross Gay and Colson Whitehead and Tanahasi Coates. I've been trying to listen to voices that are not the ones that I would normally hear. So first, learn history. Second, center voices that are unfamiliar. Third, search out humanity and hope. There is, within this legacy, within this challenging history, there have been voices and people and heroes declaring the humanity of all and professing hope, even despite destruction. Nicole Hannah Jones, who uh, wrote the opening piece for the 1619 Project, talks about this sense of moving towards humanity and hope. She writes, no one cherishes freedom more than those who have not had it. And to this day, black Americans more than any other group embrace the democratic ideals of the common good. She says, we, African Americans, are the most likely to support programs like universal health care and a higher minimum wage and to oppose programs that harm the most vulnerable. For instance, black Americans suffer the most from violent crime, yet are the most opposed to capital punishment. African American unemployment rate is nearly twice that of white Americans Yet African Americans are still the most likely of all demographic groups to say this nation should take refugees. What does it mean, what would it look like to insist on humanity even in the midst of dehumanization? Through learning history, centering voices, and affirming humanity and hope we can tell the story we find ourselves in, in newer and older ways. You may see some of you at the art gallery or the museum or the library this week. I hope so, because you'll be on my mind when I visit again. Amen. Blessed be.
and let us uh, close with our closing hymn this morning, number 95, There Is More Love Somewhere. And I invite you in body or in spirit to rise as we sing together.